Hi folks, it's Zoe here again with the EDGE team. Uh, I'm really excited today. We have an opportunity to talk uh, with Alan Smith-Reeve, uh, who is a social innovator, community organizer, and pastor, uh, who is going to share a bit about uh, the story with uh, his community, with his congregation, and the work that they've been doing. So Alan, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy to uh, share the story of uh, this little congregation on the edge of Peterborough in the Kawartha Lakes, the beautiful Kawartha Lakes, Southern Ontario. Um, I uh, joined uh, Greenwood uh, just after they had amalgamated with the second of their two point charges. Um, and uh, so these two congregations had come together um, and formed, and they had already come up with the new name, Greenwood United Church. And they were looking for a minister, a halftime minister that had been a shift from them. So that was part of their downsizing was to go to a halftime um, a staff person. Um, and they were, they were interested in this green theme. And I'd been into eco-theology uh, for, for, uh, for, for years. Uh, so it seemed like a good fit. The other thing that happened in that same year, 2015, uh, was that the National Church had put out a call for new ministry ideas. And they had set up a fund for new ministry. So, um, my partner Lynn Smith and I had uh, had uh, responded to that call. We've been experimenting with small group ministry, both of us in a separate paths. And then as we came together and formed a partnership, uh, we uh, bought this old house in downtown Peterborough. And when we saw this, this space, we said, meeting space, this would be a great space to do small groups. So we put in an application, we drew together um, uh, what eventually became uh, the board of the Bedford House Community Ministry. These were people who had walked with Lynn through her diaconal ministry training. And so uh, together we put together a proposal, took it to the presbytery, uh, asked the presbytery for support, and we received an initial grant for this new ministry that was to become the Bedford House Community Ministry. So that became the other half of, uh, of my portfolio. And we experimented uh, with all kinds of small group ministry until we came across um, uh, something called uh, Bridges Out of Poverty. And that's where we got the idea to try and experiment to invite people who, like Lynn, had lived experience of poverty. And uh, based on Lynn's experience, uh, create a small group of mentors or learning partners who would work with uh, uh, four or five people with lived experience of poverty. And so that became what we, uh, what we called a bridging team. And they would meet weekly, we would meet weekly. Um, always there was food, we would make sure there was fun and you know icebreaker activities. <laughs> what I say always, so that we are all equally uncomfortable, <laughs> kind of pushing our, our comfort zones. But we go through um, this, this uh, this training, Bridges Out of Poverty training together that talked about the hidden rules of class. So uh, you can see Lynn's story and uh, talk about uh, Bridges Peterborough uh, in other videos, but I wanna come back to Greenwood. So uh, we needed uh, a charitable partner for, if we were going to continue this, we needed to build up a donation base. And so the Bedford House Board went to Greenwood United and said, can we form a partnership? And could the congregation become our charitable partner? 
And so uh, based on you know, uh, such an agreement uh, that we saw working in other places, we formed this partnership between the two organizations. And Greenwood found a couple of board members, including our treasurer, the Greenwood treasurer, who had joined the Bedford House board. And uh, this partnership was formed. So um, fast forward a few years, the, the, uh, the Bridges Peterborough project continued to slowly grow. We trained and began to hire some of those people with lived experience to become trainers and leaders in the next bridging team. And that's happened three times now. Uh, and uh, in 2023, we've, we've now trained uh, six facilitators that we hope are going to start three bridging teams. Um, but what happened just before COVID, one of the Bedford House board members was Reverend Bill Peacock, who uh, had been pastoring a little country church outside of Peterborough called Fairview United. And on their journey, they had dwindled like so many congregations. And so they decided that they were ready to leave their building. And as torturous a decision as that was, they looked at all the options. And one of the options they decided to explore was to amalgamate with Greenwood United Church. And so uh, that happened uh, over a year long process of meeting together and talking together. Uh, Fairview. So now Greenwood was an amalgamation of three congregations. And it meant that they had sold off two buildings and now had a million dollars in the bank. So one of the first decisions they made was to hire me full time to, to cover both sides of my job. The as pastor to Greenwood United Church and as community developer, social innovator in Bedford House. And, um, you know, I remember the, um, our, the, the chair of our, our region, uh, he said to me, it's the first time he'd seen a congregation actually pay someone to look after other people than themselves this investment in my time to go and be a part of this social innovation, these creating these small community groups uh, with no expectation that those folks were, would ever become members of Greenwood United. Um, <laughs> I met with somebody out in Calgary, another pastor, and he said, are there other churches who do this? <laughs> so I don't know, but I don't know how unique it is. I'm sure there are other churches who have done this. I mean, lots of churches send their ministers to sit on community boards and do community work. But this was a, a halftime position to, uh, to steer uh, this new community ministry. Um, so, and in those in those years, it's been really exciting uh, because we've had um, storytellers, we call them, from the bridging teams come on Sunday mornings and tell the congregation their stories. And that's happened three or four or five. So, uh, and now they've, uh, they've become used to it and they, uh, they get involved in choosing the hymns and, uh, and taking turns with the prayers and uh, it's all brand new to them. Um, uh, but uh, so the folks have gotten to know each other. This is amazing, Alan. Yeah. I, I'm so curious, like, can, can you speak a little bit about the process of the congregation to come to the decision or to come to the commitment that this was part of the mission, was to fund this project that wasn't necessarily going to bring bums and pews, wasn't necessarily going to, you know, change the bottom line of the church, so to speak, but but was about being in the community. Yeah, yeah. 
it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a, a, a totally smooth or easy process, but uh, they had heard, you know, they had, uh, because we started with this joint venture agreement. And so they heard reports and read reports on paper. And so they had come to, you know, some understanding of what Bedford House was all about. Uh, but uh, it was it was a real shift. One of the biggest shifts for them was uh, after years, maybe a few decades of really living with scarcity, right? I mean, going through amalgamation processes and downsizing and scraping by and, you know, uh, they still held their church suppers, although a lot of them were getting old and tired and they couldn't do the church suppers anymore. So, but this, they had been, you know, getting by, squeezing uh, the dollars for a long time. And now suddenly they had this abundance of money. And so maybe that was one of the biggest shifts was uh, for the congregation to start thinking about, you know, what can we do with this abundance? How can we invest, you know, and the legacy for those other congregations, right? What kind of a legacy? They lost their buildings and so much of the history and uh, memories that go with those buildings. So, you know, how could they invest in the community and do something in the community uh, that would make a, make a difference? So. Wow. And has that been the experience that sort of abundance begets abundance for you folks? Because it sounds kind of like this is once the ball started rolling, it's just kept going. Well, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's still very challenging to uh, to raise funds for this community ministry. But um, but I'd like to believe, yeah, that, uh, like you say, abundance will lead to abundance. And that's the I think that's the spirit that we're entering into uh, with Greenwood is the idea that uh, by planting these seeds, by investing their money in the community, God's spirit is going to use that. And uh, that who knows uh, what's going to happen with this congregation all pretty much I'm, 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 I'm the youngest person there. <laughs> I joke, I say, I'm the only one in that congregation who has a job. <laughs> so, you know, the, the future is really uncertain. Uh, we see so many congregations uh, uh, withering and, and dying on the vine. Um, and that may be uh, the future for, for Greenwood but they've decided uh, not to wait, but to invest some of their in uh, abundance now and see what happens. Uh, and like I said, they're, they're getting to know uh, these folks uh, with lived experience of poverty who are living in poverty who would never show up on a Sunday morning for all kinds of reasons. You know, it's cross. It's a cross-cultural experience, and that's a lot of what we we study together. What are the hidden rules of a church, and what are the hidden rules when you live in poverty? You know, and and what are the cultural divides between us and them? And so often, our charity, you know, when we give to people in need, it creates an us and them dynamic. But we really are trying to be careful uh, in the church space and in the bridging team space um, to, uh, to ensure that there's a safe space of, of dignity and respect and hospitality. So we get to hear each other's stories and really get to know each other as, uh, as individuals with life stories. So. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, and I think this piece that I, you know, would be maybe one of my, towards the end of my, I've got a million questions, I'm sure I could keep you all day. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm curious about this question of legacy, because I think this is something that lots of 
churches that are kind of at this crossroads about where to next are grappling with is like, how do we decide what we want our legacy to be in our communities as we go forward? What has that been like for Greenwood to, to grapple with this question of legacy? Yeah, yeah. I think we're, we're still in the midst of, you know, of grappling with that. And, you know, we have this idea of, uh, and we've done, we've got a, a team of people who have done some uh, investigation, you know, in the community in Peterborough. And our idea is like, we have, you know, as the United Church, a vision of the kind of community that we would like to see of the, you know, of a healthy, equitable, ecological community. And so we're asking ourselves, so who else shares that vision? And how can we, um, maybe with some of our abundance, you know, plant seeds so that it's not just up to us to create a community, you know, a, a congregation, but try to step back and take that bigger picture and say, okay, who are our partners in God's vision for this community? And how can we invest? And, and so that's about relationships too. We don't want to just sign checks, but we want to, you know, maybe send people uh, uh, on their, to serve on their boards or get involved in the projects. So, you know, uh, we have some of our church members who uh, are part of refugee sponsorship, for example. And so is there a partnership uh, we can do there? Uh, we're exploring in a couple of Sundays, a local environmental center, Camp Kawartha, that does amazing jobs um, uh, educating young people and children about uh, the environment. And so like, that's that was that has been part of our church heritage right is in sunday school and uh you know sending kids to camp well we're not doing that anymore so but here's this other organization that's doing an amazing job how can we support them so that you know we're partners in this so yeah uh, but it's it's still emerging we're still feeling our way into that yeah I think this is such a great question to leave like viewers with other folks who are either just community members who are United Church members is like who else shares God's vision um, and how can we sit in relationship with them? How can we sit in partnership with them to move towards that? Yeah, 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 I'm sure, you know, and I, like I say, I, I think so many congregations have you know, uh, members who are volunteers on other organizations. Uh, but are we always intentional about seeing that as part of our ministry, our wider ministry, right? Are all these people who use our buildings, right? Aren't they members of our community? Aren't they members of, you know, uh, this mission we have? So, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's been a, it's been interesting what this little congregation, 30, 40 people on a Sunday, that's a big Sunday. <laughs> Half of them are in the choir. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say that um, thanks to you know, uh, the United Church Seeds of Hope Foundation and the EDGE staff have at different points, you know, uh, been a resource to us. And so continuing to pick up ideas and encouragement from, uh, from EDGE and EDGE staff all along the way has been uh, definitely a part of uh, keeping us, keeping us going, uh, experimenting, innovating, making mistakes, learning from those mistakes, you know, adapting, trying again. We've had, you know, dry periods where we've run out of money, had to lay off, you know, uh, both Lynn and I have been laid off at, at different points along the way. And, uh, you know, but right now we're in this season of abundance. So, 
Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm just so grateful for the work that you and Lynn have both done. And I think you're such great resources, such great mentors, such great leaders around what it looks like to really engage with the reality of what it is to, to do this kind of work, to be innovators, to continue to move forward with grace about the times where it's not working or it is challenging. And then with joy and celebration, uh, when, when we are able to find our way through uh, the challenges of being, you know, modern or 21st century church. Um, so we are so grateful to you two uh, for your leadership in that area. Um, if folks want to know more about Bedford House, if they want to chat with you about some of the work and how it came to be, where could they go to find out more or do that? Uh, so we have um, uh, websites, bedfordhouse.ca, uh, bridgespeterborough.ca, uh, uh, specifically around the uh, bridging teams. And, you know, uh, here's a plug. We've been offering uh, webinars, you know, in our practices, bridging poverty and privilege, uh, learning the practices of dignity, hospitality and curiosity. So, yeah, it, it, it's been a privilege to be able to serve and uh, working with under-resourced or people who are living in poverty. Uh, they have the leadership, they have the ideas, they have the creativity, but they don't necessarily have the privileges that Lynn and I share as United Church ministers, right? With a social network of people uh, with time and money and energy to back us up. So that's part of crossing the bridge is how can we use our privilege to support those leaders who, I mean, they really are the experts when it comes to, uh, to poverty and to uh, what it's like to, you know, why don't middle-class solutions work for people who are living in poverty, right? And they are the storytellers. So uh, yeah, and they've really enjoyed going out and talking to congregations and telling their stories. Uh, so they're, uh, they've started uh, their own little social enterprise called the Company of Conversation Changers. <laughs> and so they're available to, uh, to tell stories. Amazing, the Company of Conversation Changers. Yes, yes. Incredible. Yep. Yeah, they have uh, podcasts, again, on the Bridges Peterborough uh, website. There's a series of podcasts that they've created uh, uh, that, uh, that are really uh, pretty interesting and fun. Yeah. This is incredible and just like really lovely to see how it's unfolding to offer space and voices to folks who are pushed to the margins and to see how this is really coming together as a joint community uh, effort. Uh, it's just, a, I think, a great place for inspiration uh, for all of us uh, to think about our own practices and how we're moving. Um, thank you so much for your time today, Alan. I'm, I'm just so grateful to have heard a little bit about what, what Greenwood has done, how they have moved over the last few years, uh, and really looking forward to see what happens next or where you move to next with this work. Yeah. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, great to talk to you. All the best. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, folks. Um, the uh, links to find out more about Bedford House, more about the Greenwood congregation, uh, and uh, the folks who are running these community conversations will all be in the uh, box below. Uh, and we hope to hear your questions and to inspire some reflection in your own communities.